Hello, everybody, and welcome to my Sunday school class. Um, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Uh, our Sunday school lesson today is the topic is living faith. Okay, and uh, let me read the key verse from James chapter 2, verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Amen? Now, let us look at all the scriptures for today. Uh, they're coming from the book of James. They're coming from the book of James, chapter number 2, verses 14 through 26. And I'll be reading from the King James Version, okay? What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed, and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it had not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which, say, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. <laughs> Remember the song? Amen. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For so... At, uh, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Hallelujah! Uh, these are beautiful scriptures. And uh, let's go on with our lesson. Um, uh, and we're talking about faith and wisdom in the book of James. Our lesson names are, uh, number one, describe workless faith. Okay, workless faith. Give examples of the proper relationship between faith and works. Develop a list of ways to demonstrate faith through action and choose one to initiate personally in the week ahead. Hallelujah! All right? Okay, let's go to our introduction. Uh, and it talks about a right stroy epistle. On October 31, 1517, Martin Luther nailed the list of 95 points of disagreement with medieval Roman Catholic doctrine to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. He had come to see that Catholicism's position on the role of works in salvation did not match the Apostle Paul's emphasis on justification by faith. As debates heated up, the letter of James became more and more a source of frustration for Luther. In fact, there was a point where uh, 
uh, Luther said, uh, we ought not to even include the book of James in the Bible, in the New Testament Bible. <laughs> and of course, we know that that uh, he, he kind of mellowed out a little bit on that later on. Uh, Luther believed he was justified in his conclusions for three reasons. James seems to contradict Paul. Uh, James makes no mention of Jesus' death or resurrection. And number three, James himself wasn't of the same caliber as Paul and other apostles. Amen? Now, this was his conclusion, okay? Uh, but let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 uh, through 10. Okay? And, and this will clear it up uh, very well. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Hallelujah! And we as Baptists have sometimes <laughs> taken that to an extreme. Uh, uh, and let me explain. We, we don't read the rest of this scripture. Uh, and and it's, it's on both sides, okay? Uh, the the, the non-Baptist church go to the other extreme of legalism. And the Baptist church go to the extremes of uh, by faith alone, and by grace alone, and Christ alone. Uh, okay? And, and there should be a balance there. That's all that I'm talking about. But let's look at the, what the rest of the scripture says. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Amen. Which God had before ordained that we should walk in. So we're not saved by our works, but we are saved for good works. Hallelujah. Right there. That should clear it up quite a bit. Amen. And faith and works are just the opposite sides of the same coin, as the scripture include, uh, uh, indicates. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works. But then it says that uh, we were created, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, for good works. Amen? So our good works... Are proof of us being saved. Amen. And that's what this whole lesson is about. And of course. Uh, I can understand. Uh, Martin Luther's. Uh, uh, attitude on some of this. and Because uh, the Catholic Church. Was, was really really. Very legalistic. Uh, for example even to be saved. You had to go through. Uh, penance. And this is not repentance. This is penance. You had to do good deeds so that you would become acceptable by God. And Martin Luther really lashed on to that and said, Hey, this is nonsense because we are saved by grace through faith. Not of works. Let any man should boast. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And there were so many other things uh, in the uh, 95 theses that he, that he uh, put on the, on the church. Uh, walls on the church doors, okay, in Wittenberg, Germany, all right, so uh, I think what had happened with Catholicism was, and this is my opinion, was the pendulum has swung one way completely, and that's why Martin Luther tried to swing the pendulum the other way, but in doing so, he went a little bit too far, and we need to be somewhere in the middle, amen, Okay, Luther's attitude about James eventually mellowed, but many Christians still have a hard time reconciling James with Paul on the role of works. And as I told you, you know, from Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it's right there. Uh, and it, it says, uh, then it talks about faith working itself out in love. What is Christianity? Christianity is faith working itself out in love. <clears throat> so if you look at some of these scriptures, 
it, it kind of brings balance to what we're talking about. All right, let's look at the lesson context. For all the controversy that James 2 has generated on the role of works over the centuries, it can come as a surprise to see how often works are related to salvation elsewhere in Scripture. Hey, consider the scene Jesus paints in Matthew 25. 31 through 36. Amen. Uh, Matthew 25, 31 through 46. In the judgment, individual believers are judged on the basis of what they have done or not done their works. So it says, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't. Uh, 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 I was uh, naked and you didn't clothe me. Whatsoever you did not do unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And then uh, he said, what, whatsoever you've done for the least of these, you've done it unto me. Amen. So, so good works are very important, but they are the other side of the coin as far as faith is concerned. It's not about faith and works. It's about faith leading to good works as proof that your faith is genuine. Amen. And then Revelation 20, uh, 12 through 13 says, and you really need to go through Matthew 25, 31 through 46. I don't have the time so that so because I, I'm, I'm trying to finish this within half an hour, okay? Uh, otherwise, I would read out, read that. Uh, and by the way, I will include that scripture in my in my notes, okay, uh, in my comments. Also, a pointed statement is Revelation 20 and 12, 12 and 13, where the Apostle John says, He saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Notice it says plural. There were two books. According to the works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Amen. Okay, so in James 2, um, the first half of the chapter, verses 1 through 13, warns against discriminating against the poor in favor of the rich. Economic need also is an integral part of his argument regarding faith and works in the second half, which is today's text. Okay, um, all right, let's go on. Um, all right, um, let's look at uh, 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 James chapter 2, verses 14 and 17, 14 through 17. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? And one of you say unto them, Oh, if a brother, I'm sorry, verse 15 says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. And verse 16 says, And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace. But he be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, he give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Amen. Uh, and then verse 17 says, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, it is dead, being alone. All right? The tone of today's text is uh, somewhat combative. James is blunt. He's not a dispassionate scholar who pontificates from an ivory tower on theories of the relationship between faith and works. The phrase, what doth it profits, intends to discover what good can come about uh, such kind of faith based on the conditions James is about to discuss. Amen? 
Faith, as James is, use, is, uh, is using the term here, is a kind of confession faith. It is belief or mental assent to the notion that God exists. Faith in its fullness involves a belief and trust that assumes the action of a life lived in obedience to the law of Christ. So if we just uh, take the first part, is we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. That can just be intellectual assent. We just agree intellectually. But the fruit of our faith results in good works. Amen? Uh, and that's what he's talking about. Faith in its fullness involves a belief and trust that assume the action of a life lived in obedience to the law of Christ. So it's not just intellectual belief, but it also results in obedience. Amen? And uh, that's, that's the thing that we have to be careful of. Uh, we have to be careful about. All right? Um, like Baptists and Presbyterian denominations. Well, the non-Baptists and Presbyterians, like the Pentecostals and people like that, they go the other extreme. And they end up in, in, in legalism and just trying to work to gain favor with God. And that's an abomination. Amen? We do not. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we cannot earn it. We don't deserve it. But God gave it to us as a free gift. And that's very important. All right. Uh, some commentators have said, this example as comic, uh, oh, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, uh, verse number 15, some commentators have said this example as, as comic in its exaggeration. Surely we might say no one would be in a position of having no clothing or food whatsoever. James may be using overstatement, hyperbole for effect. Ooh, uh, you know, uh, I know this, this is not going to sit well with majority of Americans, but we have lived in a nation of plenty. So we have no clue whatsoever what poverty is. When you go to foreign countries and you see the extent of poverty, you know, when I was in Bombay, India, I've seen people, beggars on the street with no clothing, uh, almost naked except for a loincloth. You know, and and the begging on the streets. It, it is so pathetic. It's It just tears your heart. And we don't even understand some of that in America because we live in a land of plenty. But um, if you were to open our eyes and see, there are lots of places, you know, if you go to certain areas downtown, you can see the homeless people. You can see how they're struggling to survive. Amen? So, this is definitely not hyperbole. Um, all right. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, verse 16 says, And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warned and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? So you tell them, Okay, go in peace, you know, and be blessed, you know. I'll pray for you. Ooh, that's a common thing we do, don't we, sometimes. We're in a hurry. And we'll pray for you, and we just keep walking. Or we take out a buck or five bucks and give it to the person. But that's another danger, too, because if that person is an alcoholic, he might just go and spend it. Instead, we ought to find out what they really need. If they need food, we ought to go and buy them some food. So that they, and so that they can eat it, and we know that they're not going to use uh, that money for alcohol or something like that. All right, let's go on. The callousness, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding, you give them not these things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? The callousness of the word spoken here comes through clearly. Amen. The actions suggest. Uh, that we put the responsibility of finding shelter and food on the poverty-stricken person. In the scenario, as in 
Go, get yourself warmed up and fed. Well, if that guy is homeless, we need to help him. Amen? And thank God in America, there are places we can, we can take him. Uh, like the Salvation Army or the shelter downtown. or, Amen? Uh, and then sometimes the intent may be, may God warm you and fill you up. Wait a minute, we are the hands of God, you know. God may might have put me in that position. So help us, Lord, to be more compassionate. All right? Either way, the one speaking avoids personal responsibility to act to meet the need. Under the second of the two interpretations, he or she goes so far as to provide religious cover for inaction. Ooh. Oh, wow. That's horrible, isn't it? And some, we're all sometimes guilty of doing that, you know? So we need to repent. Ask God to use us for His glory to help somebody. Now, here's the question. What do you think? In what ways can you help someone receive needed clothing, food, etc. this week? Amen? Well, you might have, you know, we have closets full of clothing. And we have garage sales for our garage sales. Why can we not reach out to somebody that needs clothing and find some used clothes, gently used clothes, and give it to them? Amen? Uh, or, another way is, a lot of churches have uh, uh, clothes closets, like our church has. We can direct them there or we can go there and get them some clothes that would be the better thing um and uh so you know and there are shops in in chattanooga like the salvation army and some other shops you know uh where we can go and buy cheap clothing they're gently used in excellent condition amen and give it to those people so that would be the way to help them okay um all right. And then verse 17 says, Even so faith, if it had not works, is dead, being alone. Okay. Um, often we are dealing with a definition of faith that James is opposing. Merely intellectual acknowledgement of mental assent. Many times we are tempted to do that. We just give mental assent. Or mental acknowledgement. And that's not faith. That's not true faith. Amen. The other side of the coin is. Faith shows itself. Through good works. What questions could Christians ask themselves. That would reveal whether their faith was dead or dying. Ooh, The Bible says we should examine ourselves. To see if we are in the faith. Many times when we read scriptures like this, it convicts us. It shows us what we're not doing. And what we need to do is we need to repent, turn around, and do the things that we need to do. Amen? All right. Now, let's go on to vain faith. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. There is no demonstrating of faith without works, since faith is invisible in and of itself. But the works of which James is speaking are the necessary products of valid faith. Actions really do speak louder than words. A person who claims faith without works makes an absurd, empty claim. Amen? All right. Let's go on. Thou believest, verse 19, that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Amen? Uh,
James aff affirms that the confession is correct, but then he points out that the devils or demons believe the same thing. They know who God is. They recognize Jesus' identity. Early in Mark's gospel, Jesus encountered a man with an unclean spirit in a synagogue. You remember that story? When the man saw Jesus, the demons with him, within him cried out, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Mark 1 and 24. Amen? So the demons recognize. They know who Jesus is and they tremble. So talk is cheap, claiming, claiming to have faith uh, is of no significance at all if we do not act in faith. If demons can at least tremble, should not those who claim to belong to God act in ways that please Him? Hallelujah! Amen! Okay, let's go on. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Okay, as we consider that Abraham was justified by works, we keep in mind the context of James' remarks of having just said that faith without works is dead. James asked the question we see here in such a way that it assumes agreement. Of course, Abraham was justified by his works. Had he no faith, there would have been no works. Amen? So it's just the other side of the coin. Faith on one side, and then works on the other side. Amen? Uh, when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar, faith without obedience is dead. He obeyed God. Although that was his one and only son, the one he had, the son he had waited for for years for the promise. And then finally he came, and then God tells him, guess what? Take Isaac, go up that mountain, and sacrifice him. Ooh. What was God doing? God was testing Abraham's faith. And Abraham did not waver. He went and took his son up the mountain. And you know the story. You know, they found, even as he was about to kill his only begot, his only one and only son, you know, there was a ram that was caught in the thicket. And God said, I have provided. Amen. So, so God will provide. Amen. So, uh, but Abraham followed his faith by obedience. Amen. Now, notice that this does not mean that Abraham's faith was flawless either. He made many mistakes. In fact, you know the story with Hagar. He got in a hurry and tried to fulfill God's promise himself. And look at the mess he created. That mess has carried on for centuries now uh, but Abraham was yet a friend of God he was not perfect but he was obedient to God amen uh, and the scripture was fulfilled which said Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God amen so his obedience simply proved the fact that um, uh, uh, Abraham believed God and that it was imputed to him for righteousness and he was called a friend of God. Hallelujah! To be counted righteous like Abraham, one needs the kind of faith that leads to action. James generalizes from the example of Abraham to reinforce his point. And guys, we're running out of time. Uh, likewise also was not Rahab, the harlot, justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. Okay. Uh, so same thing with Rahab, you know. Uh, Rahab proved her faith was genuine when she helped the, the Israelites to escape and, and protected them. Amen. Um, Rahab, like Abraham, was justified on the basis of her faithful works. The singular act of harboring the Israelite spies who had entered the city of Jericho in her hospitality, she provided for Israelites who were in need. In so doing, she set an example of what James calls on his readers to do. 
Hallelujah. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And we have to be very careful about erosion of our faith. Erosion happens over a period of time. And erosion happens almost imperceptibly till after a long period of time we find out that we really have lost our faith in God. And that's why the Bible says that we should examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Amen? And that's what we need to do. What are some ways to stay alert to a danger of what has been called compassion fatigue as we help meet the needs of others? Many times, you know, we see so many needs around us that we suffer from compassion fatigue. And it's so easy with com compassion fatigue to just kind of harden your heart. And say, well, I can't meet all those needs. You know, it's just too much of this. I can't handle it. You know, and then just forget about it. Or just get immune. To the suffering around us. And that's a very, very uh, dangerous thing for us to do. So we have to stay alert uh, to the danger of compassion fatigue. We cannot get compassion. We should, we should get fired up. We should pray and seek God's face and uh, go about His business. Amen. Uh, conclusion. In proper usage, faith often equates to mere belief and intellectual acknowledgement of the existence of God. James shows us that true saving faith goes much deeper than this. It touches every aspect of our lives and guides our every action. Hallelujah! Let's say a prayer. Father, may our faith in you not be limited to a mere affirmation of your existence. Instead, may it be manifested in the way we live, including the way we extend help to those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine His face upon you. May the Lord lift up His countenance and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen and amen. Thank you.